Uh oh. <laughs> A recording in progress, that's all. Thank you, sweetheart. Okay, John, get started. Okay, so it's um, I'm John Straub from Boston University, and it's a, my pleasure to introduce Stephen Meredith of the University of Chicago. Uh, Stephen is a professor in biochemistry and biophysics at the University of Chicago. He took his uh, bachelor's degree from Brandeis uh, University in biology and English, and then a medical degree from Washington University in St. Louis before uh, taking his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Chicago. Uh, Stephen, uh, as many of you at this seminar would know, has done uh, seminal work in providing uh, fundamental insights into the structure of uh, beta amyloid and amyloid beta protein, both in the soluble form, but also uh, in uh, fibril structures using solid state NMR, uh, solution NMR. Uh, his work uh, in his lab in collaboration with Rob Tico really provided some of the very first insights into the nature of the beta amyloid uh, fibril state. And recently he has done very interesting work on seeding uh, the formation of, uh, of fibril or fibril growth from a brain derived amyloid and then characterizing the polymorphism or the, the nature of uh, variations in these amyloid uh, structures that has provided a great deal of insight into, um, into uh, the role of, uh, of uh, seeding and, and in this interesting problem of polymorphism in, uh, in beta amyloid. Uh, Stephen has has many interests within within biochemistry that I, I'm not mentioning uh, and structural biology. He also happens to have an appointment at the Divinity School um, and teaches courses in in literature, but also is an expert on the the nature of evil, which of course is a question that is on all of our our minds. So, but uh, today we're going to hear some interesting uh, interesting uh, recent work on. Uh, beta amyloid uh, fibrils. And, and Stephen, it's wonderful to have you today. Thank you very much, John, for that very kind introduction. Uh, let me make it clear that when I think about the problem of evil, I'm against it. Um, but, um, uh, oh, while I'm giving thanks, Rams, Joan, Magda, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. And, um, I'm technologically challenged, but I will try to share my screen. Um, okay, here we go. All right, so I'm going to talk today about um, heterogeneity of A beta aggregates. And this includes both uh, soluble oligomers and fibrils. Now, as I'm sure you all are aware, um, it's been shown over the last two, three decades that um, soluble oligomers of protein aggregates are more toxic than the fibrils. I don't go quite so far to say that the fibrils are not toxic um, or even less so, I don't believe they're beneficial, but um, a lot of interest has shifted from the fibril to the precursors of the fibril, which are probably the main cytotoxins, neurotoxins. The outline of the talk, and I designed my talk in a kind of a modular fashion. Uh, we will get probably to three of the modules, uh, not the fourth, but we'll talk first about nano droplet oligomers, tiny oligomers of A beta 40. Uh, move on then to uh, the subject of the amphipholicity of A beta 40 and the two ends of A beta 40, and then continue on to uh, some recent molecular dynamic simulations that I've been a part of, mostly uh, done in collaboration with Esmil Hadadian. And if there's time left, I want to talk about 
some studies we've done and recently published and are continuing on differences between parenchyma seated uh, fibrils and cerebrovascular seated A beta 40 fibrils, uh, corresponding mostly to the fibrils in um, Alzheimer's disease and cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Okay, so first, nano droplet oligomers. Now, um, when you do physical chemical studies <clears throat> on A beta, typically, or um, studies on the cytotoxicity of A beta, one typically disaggregates the protein. And there are many methods in the literature for doing this, and we've tried them all. And, um, you know, DMSO, um, HFIP, dilute base, dilute acid, and then co various combinations of those and some others I'm not mentioning. And if you do that, and you do size exclusion gel filtration chromatography, this is what you get at the end of the process. You get a solution that has a single peak and it's in the position, roughly the position of a monomer um, of the protein, of the peptide. Um, however, if you then take this peak and you do um, atomic force microscopy, and I'm gonna show you now some video scanning rate um, AFM, uh, you see this dispersion of particles on the plate. Now in this slide and every other slide I'm going to show, um, this is <clears throat> um, in solution mode. Therefore, it's not drying out on a surface. It's wet at all times. Okay, so you see this dispersion of particles. And I ask you to focus in on the area in the boxes. <clears throat> now I'm gonna show a movie and you can see these particles moving around. And every once in a while, what you see in those areas I pointed out to you is some fusion events. And you can also, if you look further, see some of the bigger particles coming apart. So you can track this over time. You can follow individual particles. You can do measurements of height and volume of the particles and track them over time. And this is what we've done. Now, even at very, very low concentrations, and I'm talking less than 10 micromolar peptide, you see some aggregates. You see they're small aggregates, but they're aggregates. And we call these nano droplet oligomers. They are droplet-like. Here's another movie to show a fusion event. And you can see these particles right here. They're gonna glom together like that. And here's another movie. I mean, you pretty much get the idea, but, uh, but the particles, particles coming in from the right and, um, and joining another particle. Now, one of the questions we asked is how do we know that these particles are actually fusing and not just stacking on top of one another when we measure the height. And the reason we believe that, um, aside from the fact that it looks like fusion, but aside from that a little more rigorously, um, if you fuse uh, two particles, the volume doubles, but the height increases only by a factor of 1.26, which is two to the one third power. And we did a lot of statistics like that and convinced ourselves that these really are fusion events, not, um, not stacking. Now, um, again, this is now, this is not video scanning rate. This is just in solution mode of AFM. But we did some statistics of particle size and we measured both height and volume. And this is a histogram. And you can see that it's a um, non-normal distribution. Up on top, you see some of the particle heights. Um, and to do some statistics on this, we did a Mann-Whitney U test. The null hypothesis was that the particle size, either height or volume, was not different at the two concentrations. And by this test, the Mann-Whitney U test, we rejected the null hypothesis. Therefore, we concluded that there is a slight increase 
in the particle size at the higher concentration. And by higher and lower, I mean 12 and 120 micromolar. So these nandos, as we like to call them, are a sparse population. And we did some NMR looking for chemical shift perturbations that would give us a clue about um, the uh, signature of nandos. And because this is very low abundance, and these are highly mobile, highly dynamic particles, chemical ship perturbations are rare, few and far between. And because this is a sparse population, the chemical ship perturbations are also very, very small. But to draw a long story short, I wanna give you kind of a cautionary tale here. We were misled um, because of course, this is a buffered solution, but very, very minor changes in pH result in uh, chemical shift perturbations, also variations in DMSO concentration if you're disaggregating using DMSO. So you have to do ultra, ultra rigorous control of pH and DMSO concentration. So we spent <clears throat> a lot of time matching pH and DMSO concentration of our peptide solution and our diluents. But to make it, so here is, you can see there are some, if you look over here at R5 or Y10, and there are a lot of chemical shift perturbations that are really due to pH variation because the peptide, even after purification, lyophilization and so forth, has residual TFA. This is not a strongly buffered solution, so the pH does drift a little bit. Likewise, if you don't match the DMSO concentration, you get chemical shift perturbations on that basis. But if you do the right homework, here are a couple of genuine bona fide chemical shift perturbations that we believe in. We don't understand why they're in this particular uh, location. They happen to be the beta carbon atoms of D23 and D7. Significance is uncertain, but we believe that they're there. Okay, but it's not very convincing. And for that reason, we turn to another technique that was more sensitive than chemical shift perturbations, and that's paramagnetic uh, relaxation enhancement. And in, in essence, we were look, we made some point mutants of A beta with um, cysteine residues so that we could attach this um, nitroxide compound MTSL to one of the cysteines. And then we look for um, uh, relaxation enhancement. Um, so in this experiment, this is a kind of a busy slide, so I'll walk you through it. Our reference is a mixture of N15 labeled A beta with an equal amount of N14 A beta. Of course, um, we are only observing the N15 A beta. And now in the blue, um, we mix now, instead of N15 A beta, we mix um, N14, L34C MTSL um, A beta. And we did that at two different ratios, a one to one ratio and a one to three ratio. And now what we have plotted on the Y axis here is the R2 inverse of the uh, T2. But as you can see, the R2 goes up a bit um, as you add the paramagnetic label and it goes up a little more when you have more of the paramagnetic label than when you have less of it. Now, one of the things we were concerned about is what, is this just an effect of having a paramagnetic compound in solution? And so what we did here was to add a small paramagnetic molecule called, called Tempo into the solution and bottom line here is that when we add this, we don't see an increase in R2. If anything, there's a slight decrease in R2 that we don't really understand um, on a, on a uh, molecular level, but it certainly isn't an, in an increase in R2 as a result simply of having a paramagnetic compound in solution. Now there's a kind of a correlation with the degree of the effect and the sequence. 
And this is a topic I'm gonna to go into. We made two of these compounds. We had L34C, MTSLA beta, and we also had Y, oh, that's a typo, this should be Y10C, A beta. And what you can see is that there's a slight decline as you go across the sequence in the uh, volume of the peak, which is another effect of paramagnetic enhancement. And that happens with L34C, uh, MTSLA beta, but not Y10C, MTSLA beta. And what we know about the sequence of A beta is that there's a, um, a there is a correlation between the sequence number and hydrophobicity. In other words, the C terminus, basically from 30 amino acid, uh, amino acid 30 onward, it's aliphatic and hydrophobic. So if you look for correlations of the PRE results with hydrophobicity scale, you see a correlation on that scale at all uh, as well. Now we looked at nine different correlations, um, hydrophobicity scales, and you see a correlation in all of them. It gets kind of tedious, um, but I'm showing you four of them here. There's one other thing we noticed about the Y10 CMTSL, and that is, and we don't particularly understand that, although I have a, a wild theory, but there's um, a de especially strong um, decrease. This is now volume ratio um, due to paramagnetic relaxation enhancement um, compared to a reference. And it's particularly strong about um, around um, serine 26, uh, that area, GLI 25, serine 26, asparagine 27. And in fibrils anyway, this is a bend or turn region between the beta sheet domains. We also did some studies and I'm gonna go through these very quickly. Um, uh, the effect of adding zinc, zinc binds to the N terminus of A beta. And here we don't need statistics to see it. There is an obvious large increase in the particle size, some of these fall out of solution, some of these stay in solution, and um, there's a loss of signal due basically to flocculation um, due to the addition of zinc. This is just a 1D spectrum in the amide fingerprint region. And of course, there are very large chemical shift perturbations in this case. So <clears throat> um, from this, um, what I think this, um, this, these studies indicate um, is something we knew to begin with, um, which is that A beta is an amphiphilic molecule. It has different ways of self-associating. It can self-associate through hydrophobic effect, and we believe this is how nandos get formed. But these are weak interactions, very transient uh, particles that come and go, they're flickering, um, flickering aggregates. But this also has to do with, this is, don't take this diagram too literally, but how A beta also associates with some membrane-like surfaces and probably with cell membranes. But in addition to that, metal ions can also cause aggregation of peptide. Um, metal ions are sparse, compared to lipid, but they have a much stronger effect on a per molecule basis. So this is our high resolution structure, um, not of nandos. We believe that these are similar to premicelles and we think about them as a kind of a second order microscopic phase, a phase order, a phase transition of the second kind or second order. Um, so these are the conclusions and I've already said them, so I'm gonna move on and come to what I've already alluded to, which is the amphifelicity of beta amyloid. And this is a tail of two ends of the molecule. There is also a hydrophobic domain in the middle, amino acids um, 17 to 21, but, and that's depicted in this slide. So this LVFFA is one short hydrophobic domain here, but the bigger hydrophobic domain is the aliphatic um, C terminus. But at the, um, at the N terminus, it's mostly 
hydrophilic amino acids. And there's also this hydrophilic section here that forms the bend or turn domain in fibrils. Now you can study the uh, properties of monolayers, uh, monomolecular films of A-beta, and this is two of the methods. And I'm gonna show you some pictures of the Denui ring, um, but Wilhelmi played as another one. But basically um, you attach either of these to a microbalance and you measure the force that is exerted as you pull the ring or the plate through the uh, air water interface or other surface. And we use the air water interface as a model for water hydrophobe interfaces. So this is the Denui ring and you're just starting to pull it to the surface. And as you pull it a little further, the um, water is vertical to the surface and that's the point of maximal force. And you can deduce, you can measure the force in, you know, works per centimeter squared or whatever. I guess we're using a millinewtons per meter squared now, but, uh, or per meter. And then as you pull it a little further, the surface necks off. But this is the one you want. And you can also do this with um, Wilhelmi plates. And if you have a lecithin molecule, here's palmitoyl, oleoyl, phosphatidylcholine. Um, what you measure here is the surface pressure, which is the difference between the surface tension of a solution with a monolayer minus the surface tension of the, <clears throat> of the clean surface. And actually this is backwards, this is minus pi. Uh, but in any case, at the low surface pressures, this behaves like a two dimensional gas. It follows this equation, which looks like a gas law. Um, at higher um, surface pressures, you have a liquid expanded phase and it follows this, um, this uh, expression here where the A0, the excluded area at the surface of the monolayer forming substance um, varies itself with the pressure, more or less linearly with the pressure. And K has the, or kappa, has the units of a compressibility constant. Anyway, if you do this with uh, beta amyloid 40, what you see here is you have a very um, um, amphiphilic molecule because you can, uh, it stays on the surface <clears throat> even to very high surface pressures, um, comparable to what you get with the lecithin molecule. Now, if you look at the excluded area, this A00, uh, it comes out to about 13 and a half angstrom squared per amino acid. If everything were on the surface, that number would be something on the order of 40 or 45 angstrom squared per amino acid. So what this tells you is that something like a third of the amino acids are on the surface and that corresponds roughly to the um, hydrophobic amino acids, which all makes a kind of sense. In the past, what we've done is we've taken a short peptide, which is not amphiphilic, KLVFF, it's fairly hydrophobic, but not amphiphilic. And we've attached a, uh, um, a fatty acid to it. And that increases the, uh, the amphiphilicity, as you can see by the uh, surface pressure. But even that one with the octanoic acid is not as amphiphilic as just A beta itself, full length A beta itself. Now, I think uh, Rams has done many studies like this, but what you can also show is that at higher peptide concentrations, A beta enters a kind of um, micelle-like state. And this is an effect of the C terminus, as can be shown by the fact that even if you put a fatty acid onto the N terminus of A beta, it really doesn't affect this curve. Now, what this curve is, this is, DPH fluorescence. DPH is a dye that tends to partition into oil phases and fluoresce. So as A beta gets to higher and higher concentration, it makes a micelle-like state and DPH enters it and fluoresces. But 
that doesn't change even if you octanoelate A beta 40. So this too is mainly a function of the C terminus of the peptide. Okay, so C terminus is hydrophobic. Um, let's talk about the N terminus now. And in fact, this is a slide from a, a review article. And what you can see, and here's the sequence, and it shows all the different cleavage sites. And one of the important ones is the alpha secretase cleavage site, which gives rise to A beta 1 through 16 in this C terminal domain, which can make fibrils. But what about the N terminal domain? Um, I think it probably can make fibrils too. In fact, I know it can make fibrils too, but you need absolutely humongous concentrations of it. There's a technical term, humongous concentrations of it to make fibrils. But let's talk about that um, N terminal peptide one through 16. Now this has a very, um, all of A beta, in fact, has a kind of a simple sequence. There's a lot, there's not a lot of amino acids. There are a lot of amino acids that are missing from A beta. There's no proline, there's no threonine, there's no cysteine, there's no tryptophan. Uh, and I'm leaving out a few others. And there's a lot of asp and glue, and there are three histidines and so forth and so on. So this is a kind of a simple sequence, and that includes the interminus. So we suspected that this could undergo some sort of um, liquid to liquid phase transition. And so I'm going to show another movie here. Uh, this is the hand of my grad student, Erin Higgins. And she's going to move this tube back and forth, showing that it is liquid. Um, but on the right, if you um, put it at cold temperature, it forms a gel. And this is turbid. You can see, see the turbidity here. And in fact, this is um, a reversible process. Um, reversible by temperature. If you, um, if you heat it at five degrees going forward towards the gel, 37, you melt it. You can also um, change this state by diluting it. And I'm going to show you some NMR pictures, which really kind of took me by surprise. Okay, here's some old school toxin nosy spectra of A beta 1 through 16. This is unlabeled peptide, toxi in blue, nosy in red. And uh, you know, it's a pretty boring spectrum. It looks pretty boring. Um, um, and it's a low concentration. But here's what happens when you do the high concentration. And the interesting thing here is that this is the high concentration at 5, 15, and 25. Now, mind you, um, this is three different states of the peptide. This is the solution at uh, 25, the um, liquid and liquid phase at 15, and the gel at 5. And yet you can see a shift. It's kind of a gradual shift. But now let's compare the low concentration to the high concentration. And here is now um, the liquid and gel state, a toxi spectrum. And when I saw this, I said to my very talented and very careful and rigorous um, um, postdoc, Atul Srivastava, I said, Atul, are you sure you have the right peptide here? Because these spectra, I mean, this is not, you go back here, you see a little shift, all right, no big deal. But this, is like, this looks like two completely different peptides. Um, and he went back and confirmed it. He even did mass spec to confirm that it was the right peptide. And so now um, the, um, the low concentration um, gives you a different, a low and high concentration gives you a very different NMR spectrum regardless of the physical state. Now, this is something we don't entirely understand, to put it mildly. This is very um, preliminary data. Uh, it's hot off the press, 
Um, but I just want to show one other thing, and that is if you um, if you make a fresh dilute solution of A beta 116, or you take take a, take a little bit of the gel and dilute it, here you get this pattern, the same spectrum by diluting um, at dilute concentration. So this is a concentration effect. Okay, now, um, so A beta one through 16 undergoes a phase transition. Um, we believe we are seeing not just, the, we are believe we are seeing some gel particles, maybe not the biggest ones, which probably would be NMR invisible, but this seems to go undergo a phase transition. Uh, we plan to, this is uh, just to look at turbidity um, of the solution, um, liquid and liquid phase separation, phase contrast microscopy is on the docket, but this forms a gel and even fibrils at very high concentration. So let's think about a beta. We have fibril forming, hydrophobic, nando forming, um, domain on the C terminus and a hydrophobic domain in the middle. We have a um, phase separating hydrophilic domain on the N terminus. And so what you have basically in the end is what's shown in this picture. Um, cats always land on their feet. If buttered bread falls to the floor, it always falls with the buttered side down. So what happens um, if one straps a slice of buttered bread to the back of a cat, well, you get a beta and it causes all, all kinds of trouble. And in the end, um, of course, fibril formation wins out, but I think it's a, maybe opposed by um, other types of phase transformations. And when you start adding co-additives into the process, I think that's where the real fun and complexity really begins. Okay, so I've said these conclusions, they're very, very tentative. They, I'm interested in your thoughts about this. In the remaining 10 minutes, I wanna talk about um, some molecular dynamic simulations. Um, we, and by this, by we, I mean mostly Esmail Hadadian um, have been doing. Um, and this is comparing three different fibril types. Now, um, these first two are, um, fibrils of A beta 40 made under so called agitated and quiescent conditions. This is Rob Tico's work, as you know. And then um, the structure of the brain seated fibrils in one of the patients, this was um, a collaboration between my lab and Rob's um, on these um, fibrils. And um, when we did these simulations, um, we made infinite fibrils by replicating a six layered structure along the Z axis using periodic images. Now we did kind of longish molecular dynamic simulations and there's an initial jump measured here, the RMDS um, in the structure. And what you can see two things, uh, first of all, is that there's initial jump um, during the equilibration period but the infinite fibrils end up with a much lower um, RMDS than the finite fibrils. And that's because the finite fibrils begin to unravel, ravel, begin to unravel. Now you can say this is kind of an artifact of simulation. Maybe it is, but I find it a very interesting artifact because to me, it seems reminiscent of what might happen when monomers of a beta peel off of a fibril, it is perhaps reminiscent also of what happens when small oligomers um, disassociate, disassemble. Okay, now the other thing that we observed about the brain seeded fibrils um, is that water begins to enter the core. I'm gonna show you some pictures of that, but there's a region here near the end terminus of the peptide where it's sitting up against the bend region of a second peptide. And there's a, um, a threefold axis of, um, of rotational symmetry. Um, here's where the salt bridge is. It doesn't really enter into this region here near the end terminus. 
Now, this is a very hydrophilic region. And in the paper on the structure of this fibril, what we also did was some um, hydrogen deuterium exchange. And this was a region that had relatively high HDX. Now, when I say relatively high, I mean as compared to other residues in the fibril. It's really, really slow uh, compared to any soluble protein. But what happens over the course of the simulation is that the water hydrates this region more and more in a gap forms. And you can trace the uh, flowing of water from the bulk solvent into the central core, which is also water filled. And you can track this entry of the central core radius increases peri passu with the increase in the number of water molecules. And you can model this. Uh, this is water can be um, entry can be analyzed as a process of um, anomalous diffusion where there's some flow that follows diffusion. Some of it is a little hindered. Some of it is even accelerated. So you have um, three different pools of water in the modeling of it. Now we also found that in one kind of fibril, the quiescent fibril, let me go back to the beginning and point something out about the structure here. This is the um, this is the twofold axis of rotational symmetry. And here uh, again, there's the N terminus is close to this uh, salt bridge between K28 and D23. These quiescent fibrils don't um, have the salt bridge. The residues are close to one another, but not close enough to make a salt bridge. <clears throat> And the agitated fibrils, <clears throat> coming back to the water flux, we also see a low level of water flux. Um, and this is probably um, the gap region of the N terminus is also contributed to by the residues of the salt bridge. So they again get hydrated and water, a little bit of water gets into the core. So this is just another fancy picture to show the different pools of water, the, uh, the diffusive, subdiffusive, accelerated diffusive um, water, water phases, if you will. Now, one other thing we found out in this, um, in this uh, modeling is that in the brain-seeded fibril, the two M4J fibrils, this the residues in a layer start out coplanar, but they begin to form a stagger that is found in fibrils, the other kinds of fibrils, and it's typically found in fibrils. And I'm very interested in hearing any thoughts you might have about that, but for some reason, beta sheets seem uh, to go to the state where the center of the, this is now to um, in the beta sheet up and down the Z axis of the fibril, long axis of the fibril, the peptides are related by hydrogen bonds. But here you have this sandwich of beta sheets and these interact with each other by side chain interactions. And the center of this uh, beta sheet that my pointer is on um, is um, in other kinds of fibrils is at the I to I plus two beta sheet. So there's a kind of a stagger between the beta sheets. And even in the molecules that start out coplanar, the molecules uh, of the layer start out coplanar, they begin to form a bit of a stagger. Okay. Now I have exactly three minutes left for this and um, I'll maybe go two minutes over. Oh, wait, wait, actually, we started four minutes over, so I'm okay. And I want to just mention some um, studies on brain seeding. <clears throat> and this is, um, some of this work is old, uh, started with Rob Tico. And the basic idea is we go and get brain of people who had Alzheimer's disease, biochemically isolate the amyloid, and use this 
And what Rob showed was that you can make replicate fibrils by seeding. So you take these fibrils, you sonicate them, you put them into synthetic A-beta solutions with the appropriate um, isotopic labeling for NMR. You get these fibrils that um, seem to be replicates on the level of NMR and transmission EM, and you can look at the structure. And we did that with um, plaque material. But what we were interested in now is looking at some of these mutations. Um, and we know that there are some point mutations of A-beta, these two, D23N, the Iowa mutation, E23Q, the Dutch mutation, where the patients have not so much neuritic plaques and Alzheimer's disease, they actually have cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Um, um, the A-beta deposits in blood vessels and they have hemorrhagic strokes. Um, if they develop dementia, it tends to be on a vascular basis. So what we did was we didn't have um, patients with those mutations, but we isolated blood vessels and neuritic plaque material, got the amyloid from them and made replicate fibrils of each of those. And here's data, here's the chart showing the patients. Some of them had um, cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Some had um, only uh, Alzheimer's disease. Patient four had only Alzheimer's disease. Um, no CAA um, did transmission EM. I'm not going to dwell on this. But we did solid state NMR. These are, this is in collaboration with Yoshitaki Ishii. And this is um, C13, C13 correlational uh, 2D spectra. And um, using this peptide, which is uniformly labeled mostly at the end terminus. Um, this is also of unseated fibrils and I'm uh, again, not gonna dwell on it, but just to say that these spectra are completely different from this spectra, spectrum. Now, the interesting finding, what I want to focus on is that the amyloid from two different sources gives you two different spectra in the seeded fibrils, both A-beta 40, both labeled in the same position, seeding done on the same, um, under the same conditions. And you can see in alanine 2, phenylalanine 4, and glutamine 15, there are structural differences. There's also polymorphisms. So in, when you do brain seeding, you very often get a single structure that dominates all the seeded spectrum, spectra. In this particular case with these patients, that was not the case. You have two or three structures through two or three peaks for each of these residues, for each of these spin systems. Do the statistics, these um, chemical fit perturbations are statistically significant at a certain um, confidence level. Now, we asked the question, what is it that accounts for the difference between, um, between vascular seated and parenchyma seated A beta fibrils? Is it something else in the parenchyma or the blood vessels? And here are two candidates that we would like to, that we believe can be ruled out. First, blood vessels have a lot of collagen. And so we tested the effect of adding collagen or adding um, collagenase um, to get rid of collagen in the blood vessel sample. And to cut a long story short, this has absolutely no effect on anything, on either the kinetics or the NMR spectra you get. Now, the other thing is that the A beta in blood vessels is very A beta 40 rich, whereas the parenchyma is very is enriched in A beta 42. Now, to give an editorial here, even the parenchyma that's enriched in A beta 42, it's mostly A beta 40 still. 
it's about 80% A beta 40 by our measurements and some in the literature. But again, if you try to seed with A beta 42, basically it doesn't happen. Um, here's the A beta 40 seed, and there is no seeding when you add A beta 40. And we added a hell of a lot of A beta 40 to this, and we basically don't get seeding. Now, one other finding is that we did some X, uh, some fibril X-ray diffraction. This is work done with Joseph Orgel at um, Illinois Institute of Technology. And to show the difference in the meninges seeded, the vascular seeded sample, um, you can see this um, reflection at about 10 or 11 um, angstroms is much stronger in the vascular seated in some patients, not all, uh, in this patient four and patient two, but not in one and three. And um, Joseph um, argues, and I think correctly, that this indicates a um, higher degree of order in the vascular seated sample than in the, va than in the parenchyma seated sample. <clears throat> So in conclusion, there are differences between parenchymal and vascular seeded replicate fibrils at several sites. This should be a beta alpha alanine two, not 22. I didn't show you the valine 12, but there's also a, a small chemical shift perturbation there as well. Um, X-ray fibril just uh, diffraction studies show indicate um, that the vascular seated fibrils are more ordered than the parenchymal seated fibrils. Um, the differences may be due to different nucleation conditions at the two sites, parenchyma versus blood vessels. And I think this may have some relationship to the pathophysiology. What else do you have aside from A beta in your brain parenchyma in your blood vessels? In other words, even though I work on A beta, and I like A beta and I find it fascinating. It's not all beta, all, all A beta all the time. Okay, I wanna give some acknowledgements. Um, the Nando's work, Jay Pittman, um, graduate student now doing his postdoc on MRI at Tool Srivastava, Jonathan Cervik, uh, Barak, Barat Venkata, and Pat Moore and my friend and colleague uh, co-directs the NMR facility with me, uh, Joe Sockleben, um, graduate student who's been working on this phase transition stuff with Atul, um, Aaron Higgins and um, Atul Srivastava. And I wanna just give a little plug here. If any of you are looking for a very talented biochemist, biophysicist, who knows a hell of a lot about NMR um, at Tool at some point will be on fairly soon, um, will be on the job market. Um, um, that's um, that's that's um, his choice, not mine. Would love to keep him. And Yoshitaka Ishii um, and Joseph Orgel for the um, brain seated um, work. Um, also, Catherine Charapels. It's her PhD, a lot of her PhD thesis, our um, neuropathology colleague, Peter Pytel, and Esmil Haddadian, um, Esmil Haddadian for the simulation work. And I wanna give my final thanks to Rams, Joan, and Magda for the invita kind invitation. And I especially am impressed the, with the fact that Joan had to be up before 7 a.m., at which my heart doesn't even beat. Um, and it's, it's truly amazing. Thank you so much for the invitation. Great, thank you, Stephen, for a, a really thought-provoking talk. You covered so many interesting areas of A-beta biophysics, and I'm, I'm sure we'll have some, uh, some great questions. I, I wanted to ask you, going back to the beginning of your talk, where you were talking about the uh, amphipholicity and the difference in the nature of the N and C termini, when, right. you're, when you showed uh, in one of the uh, diagrams uh, where you had the insertion of the C-terminus and the N-terminal region sort of out in solvent, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, I mean, what do you imagine for the, the structure of A-beta 
at the interface? And do you think that there is, as has been observed in simulations, a significant helical character so that if you do see insertion of that C-terminal region, do you think that it might be a sort of a shorter C-terminal helix? Is there any, any insight in that, into that? Well, um, I think, first of all, um, Rams probably can speak to this more than I can, but um, this, this peptide wants to be an alpha helix at some level. Um, if it's properly solvated by lipids, it is an alpha helix. Um, it does form an alpha helix by, by um, and I, I, your work, John, has shown the, uh, the, the kink in the alpha helix. I mean, there is, it's not a, uh, it's not a perfect alpha helix to be sure. Um, I think the, the problem is uh, that is not a high resolution picture. It's a cartoon. And um, I think it inserts probably not very deeply that um, that carboxyl group needs to be ionized, needs to be hydrated. And I think, um, um, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm, it might form some kind of bend structure, um, perhaps at, the, at that diglycine residue. Uh, it's a great talk, uh, Steve. Uh, congratulations. I love the Nandu's uh, story. <laughs> Uh, so just to, just to comment on the helical structure, we only yeah. showed the disordered helix, very loosely structured yeah. treatment helix in the central region, six, yeah. I think 16 to 22 or so, yeah. um, where the fee fee plays a role in, in retaining the structure. Yeah. But uh, I think Michael Zagorski showed that obviously it forms a helical structure in my cells and then pore formation through helical structure as well. So these are transient structures. So I wanted to get back to your, uh, the beginning portion of your talk, where you said um, TFA uh, impurities play a big role. I do agree with that very, very big role because most of the synthetic peptides are not really that pure. Even 98% is not pure enough. So uh, have you compared the results with biologically expressed ones? So this is biologically expressed actually. Then where does the TFA come from? Well, purification. Oh, I see. You go PLC, it comes from purification. We lyophilize, and we've taken uh, multiple lyophilizations, and you know, it's just it's hard to get rid of. We've done um, F19 NMR uh, yeah, to it monitor it, and it gets pretty low. It gets undetectable even by F19 NMR, but it is really tough to get rid of. Even worse is the very trace amount of metals, which are undetectable, even nanomolar concentration Absolutely. in the aggregated species. So Absolutely. did you have any, uh, did you check with the concentration gradient for metals and see yeah. this NANDU yeah. formation? Yeah, we've done, we've done both. I mean, we've done, so what we've done is we've done ICP mass spec to monitor the metal concentration and it's not there by ICP mass spec. I, uh, I have some issues with ICP mass spec, or maybe it's the facility I was using, but uh, do you have a, do you know a good one, by the way? For I don't know, it's because nanomolar is very difficult to take. Maybe NMR is the best one to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you do, you do see the, I, I, I see that you are one to 16, sorry, there are many questions are coming up, but I, let me ask you quickly one, that you are one to 16 peptide aggregation behavior Right. You do see this relaxation behavior is weird, uh, which is kind of unexplainable um, in, for some residues like D4 and D27 or so. Yeah. Do you think it's because of the intermolecular interaction that altered the correlation time, which are not directly detectable maybe by other right. means? This could be a way to yeah. detect. Well, you know what? I mean, first of all, we've only done two sites. We need to do a lot more of that. Right, um, and I don't know. I mean, those are sort of weak peaks, so it's possible there's some artifacts. Um, F4 is not so weak, but some of the peaks there are kind of weak, and um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure how to explain those end terminal findings, to be honest with you. Melachini, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Melachini is in the panel. Go ahead, Melachini. Giuseppe, okay. hi. Uh, hi, Stephen. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I really uh, enjoyed it. And uh, I do have a lot of questions about the nature of uh, evil and the cats and uh, 
butter bread, but I'll keep those for later. Okay. Um, I, I was really uh, impressed by those changes uh, uh, during the transitions to, to gel for the A beta 116. Th yeah. Those NMR changes are really remarkable. And as I was glancing to, to that slide, one, one feature of your homonuclear 2D uh, spectra that caught my attention was that if you look at the water line around 5, 5 ppm, uh, you had quite a bit of exchange with, between water and the amides in the absence yes. of gel. But when, yes. when, when you had the transition to gel, that was wiped out uh, almost entirely. So my yes. question for you for that uh, was, do you think is the gel doing something to the water or perhaps are the amides becoming less exposed uh, in the gel phase? I think that's an excellent suggestion. Um, I don't know what to think yet, to tell you the truth. Um, we have to do a lot more experiments. This is very recent data. Um, in fact, the last spectrum, a tool emailed it to me last night at about oh, 8 Okay. So, yeah. So, it's so, quite exciting but, that there is such a big change and it's detectable. But so. I'll tell you one thing that's absolutely on the docket is exchange studies, uh, relaxation studies. There's something going on there we don't understand for sure. Okay, I'll look forward to, to hearing more about that. And then sorry, the more... Just, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Let me uh, ask you a comment on that. So why wouldn't you think that going from isotropic liquid to gel phase would change the correlation time? Or even water won't be that clearly observable. The intensity should go down. But the gel has, uh, has trapped water in it, so maybe there's a special pool of water. Sure. Sure, more, um, more ordered water, less mobile, so that can alter the yeah, system. Yeah, right, exactly. And I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm uh, talking off the top of my head. I, I don't know this, but that's that's kind of what I'm thinking. There's something weird about the water there. Maybe that's something uh, that you can link to to new MD simulations. It looks right. like you you have a good handle on, on water on that side as well. The the other more general question I had, since the uh, overarching theme of your presentation was about a beta heterogeneity, was whether you think there is some sort of correlation between heterogeneity and uh, reproducibility, or or you you can have some sort of uh, uh, distribution that is very heterogeneous and yet very reproducible. Yeah, well, we're, we're, we worry a lot about reproducibility. Yeah, everybody in the, in the beta field, yeah, we're all everybody on the same boat. Beta amyloid better worry about reproducibility. Right. Um, but when we do the seedings, there are always, we do, you know, multiple samples and right. spectra uh, because we worry about that. I mean, we worry a lot about that. So what I can tell you is that the spectra you're, you're, you were looking at is at least triplicate samples and spectra. Right, right, right. right. So, so basically you can have something heterogeneous and yet quite reproducible. Right, yeah. yeah. In, in terms of the differentials that you see, I mean, those Nandos are really interesting. And, and um, my understanding is your uh, C13 PPM differences survive all your pH controls. But did you also check uh, um, amide uh, PPM changes? Often those are much yeah. more sensitive. Oh yeah, we even did 3Ds. I mean, we did a lot of 3Ds mm. um, just, just because we were, you know, the thing is um, this, um, we had a, uh, an intense period of soul searching because we first we thought there were CSPs and a lot of them are artifactual. So we had to uh, go back and look very carefully at that. And then we said, you know, uh, if we really believe this, there have to be some CSPs. I'm not sure that's really true, but we looked very closely. We did HNCOs and, you know, HSQs, and we did uh, uh, um, HNCO, CACB, I mean, a whole bunch, whole alphabet soup of spectra, just looking for chemical shift perturbations. Okay. And I, you know, I would, if these are real, yeah. what do they mean? Why those right. two for crying out loud? <clears throat> right, right. That's always the challenge with chemical shifts, right? What do they mean? Yeah. Right. Vijay. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Vijay, uh, you have a question? Hi, Steve. Hi, Vijay. Uh, 
So I, I, I'm really fascinated by these new perspectives on A-beta that you've showed. It's just truly fascinating. Particularly, I mean, I have a question and some perspectives about this Nando's that you showed. Uh, so obviously, it looks like uh, when, you, when you see the phase separation, it's, it's a concentration dependent phenomenon, obviously, right? So when you, when you and particularly, I'm, I'm looking at your AFMs when you lowered the concentrations and you started seeing more of those liquid droplets. Uh, okay, so have you, right. pardon me? Different peptides. The phase separation is the the gel thing. That's one through sixteen only. Right, right. So I'm talking about the full length A beta forty, the, the initial okay. part of it. So when you lower the concentration, my question first is that: Do you have you seen or established a sort of a phase boundary where the concentration above which you probably won't see it, it quickly forms aggregates? Uh, yeah, yeah. Is that, is well, that I, I think this is basically what happens if you have full length A beta at a high concentration. Before you know it, the nandos are gone, you have big oligomers, and then you right. get fibrils. Okay. It's, this is all a low concentration phenomenon, too low to make fibrils. We're always, when we, in all of the nandos work, the highest concentration we ever got to was 100 micromolar. And um, you really don't make fibrils very well at that concentration. I mean, you, you wait a long time, you get some, but, um, but most of it was much lower than that, like 60 and 30 and 15 micromolar. So um, I think you, if you do that, you eliminate one part of the phase diagram. It doesn't come into play. Now, um, we had fantasies that maybe we would see big droplets like some people have seen, for example, with fuss peptide in combination with RNA, you get these huge yeah. droplets that you can see by phase contrast microscopy. We might yet see them with A beta one through 16, but I don't think you ever get those with one to 40 because the, it's, the peptide is pulled so much in the direction of making big oligomers and fibrils. Right, that, that was my suspicion, but, I, but, but putting this one to 16 idea together, uh, would I think it makes a lot of sense if you actually go into the physiological concentrations and animal range. Maybe that is the initiating part where electrostatics are actually predominating for the space separation, which transitions into fibrils later on. Maybe. Yeah, I mean that's that's um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I mean, you you couldn't. Uh, gee, how would you do NMR on that though? I mean, you couldn't basically. I mean, uh, you'd have to do something else. I'm not sure what. Yeah, but... very very interesting. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Ashtosh, would you like to ask your questions? Uh, hi, I think your talk, I found it very fascinating. I have been very interested in A-beta diversity, aggregate diversity. And uh, there are two questions I had in this, the LLPS experiment that was done using different concentrations of amyloid beta and you saw a difference in temperature, what were those concentration of the amyloid beta that were taken? So are you talking now about the um, Nando's work or the gel transition? Yeah, you were talking about a phase transition of amyloid beta say from uh, normal temperature to five degree, 15 degree, and, ah, and right. you're seeing the phase transition. Right. Uh, so, and oh, then you oh, had right. used NMR structures with that, where you had at a higher concentration and a lower concentrations, and they were very distinct. Right. So you had some liquid liquid phase separation, a sol gel kind of state. So I want to. Yeah, those were very high concentration. Those were in the millimolar range. And in fact, some of them went up even to about 50, um, no, call it to 20 millimolar. Okay. So some the, of them, it was generally very high concentration. Very good. And I was also very intrigued by the seeding experiment that result you showed uh, where you mm -hmm. had the purified A beta from the brain and then those seeds were given. Right. And that produced heterogeneity in the aggregated sample. Right. Uh, my question is, those aggregates, when they were purified, 
how homogeneous they were because you can purify them a light beta, but they may have certain modification, they may have certain oh, yeah. uh, structural arrangement, and uh, that may contribute depending upon the composition to what the seed looks like to the difference yeah. in how they promote that. Right, so the first thing that I can tell you for sure is that this is, I mean, I don't, I don't, like expressing certainty a great deal, but here's something I'm certain about. This is, those seeds are not pure A beta. Okay. They're, they have all kinds of junk in them. And uh, we did some mass spec studies. Um, other people have done a lot more than, than we've done. And <clears throat> there are a lot of proteins in there. Uh, this is also, um, this probably includes modified A beta, I'm, I mean, I can go further than probably. This includes modified A-beta. We did some studies to try to look at the uh, chain length, A-beta 40 versus 39, 40, 41, 42, 43. The technique we used was cyanogen bromide digestion, which is at methionine 35, and then uh, mass spec of the C-terminal fragments, LCMS of the C-terminal fragments. And um, we didn't, those were not terribly revealing studies, but you know, um, this, is, this is not pure A-beta. And let me just make one clarification here. Um, whether you have one set of spin systems or two or three is patient dependent. Doesn't depend on the region of brain you use and the number that you get in replicate samples is very consistent for a particular patient. So patient one, let's say, will have one spectrum, no matter what, if you take it from the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe. Patient two, it'll be two, but it'll be the same no matter where in the brain you get the amyloid. And now let's take patient one and patient two, one spectrum each, but they're not the same spectrum. So it depends on the patient. It's telling us something about the patient. Is it the impurities in the amyloid? I'll tell you this much. What we did was different degrees of purification. So this is a multi-step process. We extract with SDS. We extract with we do enzymatic digestion, trypsin digestion, collagenase digestion, stuff like that. How much of it do we do? Um, if you do a little more, you get less seeding material, but the spectrum looks the same at the end of the day. So, so when you analyze these peptides, looks like to a great deal. Did you look at any post-translational modification they may have? Uh, we did not. We did not. Um, I would bet anything that they're there. And I believe that there are covalent crosslinks too. And those come from at least two sites. One is that transglutaminase, tissue transglutaminase, crosslinks lice 16 and glutamine 15. And when you get oxidative damage, I believe that tyrosine 10 is very prone to make free radicals. So I believe you get tyrosyl, tyrosyl dimers. So I think at least those two types of covalent crosslinks are there. And there are probably lots of others. There are metal ions. They don't, they don't necessarily give up the ghost when you add EDTA. I mean, I think there's all kinds of stuff in the samples. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, I wanted to uh, forward a question. Uh, well, first of all, a, a compliment on a very nice talk from Max Lindberg. And then he asked, why not purify with size exclusion chromatography instead to avoid the TFA? Oh, well, we do, and there's still TFA there. I see. I mean, it's hard to get rid of. It's actually very hard to get rid of. Um, I mean, you can get rid of it. I'll tell you one other thing. We, in a sense, created a problem for ourselves because we've seen umpteen studies by cell biologists 
And some of my best friends are cell biologists, so I'm not putting them down. Um, but um, what they do is they take <clears throat> a beta, disaggregated, put into a dilute buffer because they have to put it on cells, all right? So they'll, for example, use HEPIs, dilute HEPIs. And that's what we did. Now, because we use dilute HEPIs, what we wanted to show is that the monomers are not really monomers. They have these transient aggregates in them. But we created the problem for ourselves because these weren't really very well buffered solutions. Now we've since repeated those, some of these studies using real buffers. I mean, stronger buffers, phosphate at higher concentrations. But um, that was, the TFA is hard to get rid of even with buffer and size exclusion, it clings. Okay. Yeah, but why would you need the TFA from the beginning? Pardon me? Yeah, why would you need the TFA from the beginning? Oh, that's just from the HPLC purification. Leftover from the HPLC purification. We purify yeah, but Why would you need the pH uh, LSE if you would do it recombinantly and size exclusion well, we several we, steps, we, we, uh, maybe with we, an ion exchange as well. Well, then we you skip that we, whole step uh, and then you get rid of the TFA from the beginning. If you do that, you get a very impure peptide. We've done size exclusion and gel and um, ion exchange chromatography as additional modes. It's not as pure as HPLC. It's just not as pure. Okay, because uh, this is uh, in our group we, we do it, and I think that um, we, we can prove that it's very pure peptide in the end. Right, but, but what, um, by what method? By what method? By uh, recombinantly expressing then ion no. exchange and then several um, cycles of uh, no. size exclusion with no. hypothesizations no. in between. So first of all, our peptide is expressed. It's not synthetic. These are expressed peptides. And we do that as well. And by mass spec, we see impurities, lots of impurities when we do that. What, what method okay. do you use to assess purity? Um, I'm not completely sure, but uh, I think we've done several. Uh, but mostly, I think we see it in the kinetics uh, at um, with very low impurities, you get quite substantial effects on kinetics. So when the kinetics is, um, I'll tell you, good, then you have the pure, and I'll also tell you, by yeah other methods. But yeah, be very careful about that, okay? Because I'll tell you, we've done that kind of thing. Uh, you know, that's um, that was my uh, my upbringing: size exclusion and ion exchange chromatography. And uh, you still have a lot of stuff in there that isn't a beta 40 when you do that. Uh, we even, um, this is also, um, <clears throat> we have a his tag. So we, um, we do um, nickel NTA followed by size exclusion. And we've also done ion exchange and it's not pure. We need HPLC. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Thank you for your right. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Max. Uh, Binju, do you have a question? Hi, yes, a very interesting talk, Dr. Meredith. Um, I have a question about your brain uh, seeding experiment. So you, you're, you're showing uh, the heterogeneity or variation of your final product from two different locations. One is the parenchyma, the other is vascular related source. Uh, can you since your initial material from those two sources, uh, you're showing, you're saying it's uh, quite, could be quite different, you know? Can you dissect the factors? Because I think one of the previous, uh, 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 the question uh, panelists showed saying maybe post-translational modification could be different. Because there uh, could be a lot of a different uh, factor contributing to your final result. So do you think oh, it's maybe just impossible to dissect because there are so many factors such as, you know, your degree of post-translational modification or, you know, some metal ions or some other cofactors. And maybe also, you know, in your seeding 
uh, reaction, do you have like any other cofactor added such as, uh, you know, arachidonic acid or, you know, heparin type of things? Well, um, we don't, we don't consciously add any other factors. It's whatever is in the, uh, whatever is in the um, isolated fibrils from the brain or the blood vessels. Now we, uh, I mean, I think, um, uh, I think post-translational modifications will be very important. Um, <clears throat> I think impurities could also be very important. However, let me tell you about some of the things that we've done um, to get at that. So first of all, the two that we thought about, A beta 42 from parenchyma and collagen from blood vessels. And um, we're pretty convinced that those are not the factors because A beta 42 just is very bad at seeding A beta 40 fibrils. And uh, which is surprising, although it's a little less surprising now that we're starting to see some of the structures of A beta 42 fibrils. They're really very different from A beta 40 fibrils. And collagen, you can add collagen different kinds. You can digest away the collagen with collagenase, has no effect on the kinetics or the NMR spectrum. Now, as far as impurities are concerned, um, you know, this is. Um, this is a very complicated question because I think there are a lot of impurities in there. This is not, not, not puree beta that we're seeding with. However, we've done things that are fairly drastic to get rid of some of the impurities. For example, SDS digestion, uh, extraction. Um, we've done protease digestion and amyloid is resistant to proteases. That includes but is not limited to collagenase. Uh, we've done some organic solvent extractions to try to get rid of lipids. We've tried, we've added EDTA to try to get rid of metal ions. I mean, we've done these things and I don't think, you know, it's a negative result except, uh, so, you know, we do these things and there's no change, okay? So here's the, here's the, the result. We can take, um, fairly clean, we, in the lab, we refer to it as brain goo. We can take fairly clean, dirty brain goo or more cleaned up brain goo or very cleaned up brain goo. In the end, it's still brain goo and it has impurities in it. But no matter where along the purification, once we've done the initial extractions and have something that looks by transmission EM, like fibrils, if we use that, we get the same solid state NMR spectra. Very so it means, sorry. Very interesting. Uh, I was wondering whether, can you comment on the you know, significance of those different locations, parenchyma versus vascular, or it, that difference is uh, there are too many complicating, confounding factor can contribute to that? Well, you know, um, yeah, sure, I can comment, <laughs> but uh, I might not be right, but I can comment. Um, so I think, um, here's what I think. I think all of this heterogeneity arises during nucleation, or let's say 99% of it arises during nucleation. Why do I say that? The whole seeding phenomenon, and here you can do this with pretty pure peptide. You remember the way this all gets started is you take pure A beta, you fibrilize it in different ways, and you use those, and you get different kinds of fibrils, and you use that to seed, and you get replicate fibrils. Now that tells me that all of this heterogeneity or most of it arises during nucleation. Okay, now in the brain, a blood vessel is not the same as brain parenchyma, different nucleation conditions. And here's where I think the impurities and perhaps the post-translational modifications play a big role. You have different nucleation environments and you get different kinds of fibrils. 
And once you're down that road, you just continue down that road. And so now we come along um, and a cadaver, we take the brain or the blood vessels and we use those to isolate our amyloid. And I think in the end, you know, you can say, yeah, there's all these details, all these other things in the amyloid, but in the end, it's mostly amyloid. And I think that's what's doing most of the seeding. Let me tell you another control that I think is very important. I had it on the slide, but I didn't comment on it. You can take people who don't have Alzheimer's disease or CAA and go through the same steps and you isolate at the end, you have a little bit of goo brain goo, and it does not seed at all, okay? So we think the seeding is something that is specific to the amyloid plaques. I can't prove that it's the A beta in the amyloid plaques. Maybe it's the amyloid in complex with um, tau or transthyretin or who knows what else is in the plaque. Very fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Have a question from Long Cheng. Well, thank you so much for your very uh, insightful talk. Actually, I'm very excited about uh, your isolation, you know, A beta from brain and uh, CAA. Actually, I'm very positive with that because uh, if you think about a uh, lot of uh, similar experiment done by McDonald or Weijin Li, they isolated the seed from brain. They definitely complicated. But in general, I think for the seeded fiber reflected some property of the original extraction, A beta specific, that's very insightful because think about the prong like or different strands. And also, I feel like a very insightful. I know you mentioned a lot of protonic data done with this brain, but I do think a lot of work already done to compare side-by-side side, the CAA uh, protomic compared to the uh, brain tissue. I think because uh, it's a very side because A beta also play very important role like neuroinflammation. People still don't know it's good as bad. Also in you know, the CAA maybe quite a different role independent of the brain tissue. And also the APOE also tau use even like chronic. So I, I just, what my question is, uh, you said you did the protomic with CAA and the brain. And uh, do you ever look at a global protomic change to compare what's, uh, what, what's a pathological or physiological role that's two different A beta might play? I think that's very, very important to, to dissect out why you have uh, two population A beta. And, uh, what's the role of CAA in AD and what the brain in CAA? I think that were very, very valuable data. Yeah, I mean, most people have both. Um, if you have one, you're likely mm. to have the other. There are some people, and it's not just the point mutants, some people with wild type um, yeah. you know, um, AB, APP, um, some of them just have CAA and some of them don't have, um, have just, parenchymal plaques and no um, CAA. One of our patients, patient four was like that. And um, <clears throat> I defer to Peter Pytel, our um, great neuropathologist who, uh, you know, he did a very thorough search for both conditions, you know, with uh, immunofluorescence studies and the like. But you're right, uh, the blood vessels, um, I think um, it goes in, both directions. Um, blood vessel disease can contribute to Alzheimer's disease because probably uh, neuroinflammation, I mean, inflammation is a property, not just neuroinflammation, but inflammation, period. It's a property of vascularized tissue. I remember um, once upon a time, the reason articular cartilage doesn't get inflamed is that there are no blood vessels in it but brain has lots of blood vessels and it gets inflamed. And so the effect of what does the amyloid in blood vessels do to neuroinflammation um, in the brain parenchyma? And it can work the other way around too, because remember the, 
a beta goes in two directions. It leaves the brain too. Um, and so as it leaves the brain, does it get stuck in the blood vessels and cause um, some sort of leakage syndrome in the, in the blood vessels? I mean, I'm, this is rampant speculation, obviously, but, uh, but it, it, I think these two conditions do interact. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting because you already mentioned, uh, you know, probably not only the oligomer A beta, also the fibro has toxic. I just wondering, is a, is a possible if you're using some like a to test the toxic or neuroinflammation triggering mechanism using two different fibro introduce the cell model to see which fibro is more toxic or which more or the fibro type is more neuroinflammation regulatory. That would be very interesting. Yes, I, I think that would be very interesting. Actually, Rob Tico um, did some studies like that. Um, I mean, not, you know, I mean, he's not a cell biologist, but, but he did some studies looking at the quiescent versus um, agitated fibrils. And they, there was a difference about which one was more cytotoxic. I don't remember which it was, but one of them was a little bit more cytotoxic than the other. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, if, are, is there any, with the Dutch, uh, the Dutch mutant and that uh, different manifestation of the amyloid, is, has heparin ever been proposed to play a role in that? It's very much so, actually. Um, and it's not just heparin, um, glycosamine glycans in general. Okay. Um, I think uh, that has been proposed as a possible co-nucleator of beta amyloid. I mean, I looked at that, I even uh, toyed with the idea of APOE doing something like that. Um, um, nothing much came of it in my hands anyway, but I know other people have um, have looked at um, glycosaminic glycans as important co-nucleators. Right, okay, thank you. Hmm. Um, we have Bina on the panel. Hello. Hello. Would you, would you like to pose a question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yes. Thanks for that lovely talk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first is uh, when you take uh, the seed from the brain sample and then you uh, create the fibrils in vitro, and if you were to break them down and reuse those in vitro generated fibrils, do they still have the memory? of generating the same kind? Because at this point, your experiment is pretty clean because you've already got predominantly the pure material that you're starting out with. Yes, in fact, here's what we did. So we have the brain seed and sometimes that's enough. We sonicate it, we get seeding, end of story. But what we've done, sometimes we get not very good spectra because, you know, I, I, I saw some solid state NMR folk out there. Um, and, you know, some, it's not a very sensitive technique. Uh, so sometimes what we do is we take the first generation fibrils and sonicate those and use it and we get replicates. All right. And sometimes even a third generation or fourth generation and we get replicates. Now, <clears throat> what happens is that the the spectra, the first, sometimes the first generation spectra are not beautiful to look at. There's a lot of noise um, in the background. And so the second generation spectra um, are a little bit cleaner looking. What we worry about is whether we're selecting for a subtype of fibril. But I can tell you that in general, what it looks like is that we're getting the same kind of fibril um, but just sharper, um, less background noise. Okay. Uh, second question is probably a little bit of follow-up on Long Chang's question. So if you take the uh, seed from the brain sample and then you create fibril using um, the mutants, the peptide generated from the mutants, do you see a difference? Can you, you know, uh, can you get information about uh, the extent of toxicity associated with the mutation 
to the kind of fibers that you are generating? Would you would we be able to get that kind of an information? Yeah, that would be a very interesting study to do. We have not done that, um, but um, we we. Uh, a long time ago, we did some studies on the Osaka mutant, which is the deletion of uh, E22. Um, and it makes fibrils super fast. And what we found is that it can seed wild type A beta so that it too, just in terms of kinetics, it's a super potent seeder of wild type A beta. But we never really, uh, went very far with that, but it would be very interesting to go back and take some of the brain uh, brain goo and try seeding the mutant peptides with it. See what, I mean, I'm not sure what we would get, but it would be a very interesting study. So I think your study has added one more layer of complexity. Earlier it was about the kinetics of seeding, but now you have also heterogeneity of the different kinds of polymers. So, you know, yeah. is toxicity, a combination of the two or which one is, you know, more effective is something to look at, I was thinking. Yeah, you know, the, um, in our lives, we're looking for more simplicity, not more complexity. We have more than enough complexities already. <laughs> but um, but um, I can tell you that some patients you get when you seed with their amyloid, you only get a single structure. There's no heterogeneity at all. If there once was, it's gone. And, you know, um, we've speculated about why there's only one, because you have amyloid and it's one of its main properties is, um, um, is polymorphism. So why do you get only one spectrum from some patients? You'd expect more or from different regions of the brain. Why do you get only one? Um, it's a little hard to understand why that is. And, you know, one, among the possibilities, one is that um, you have, um, uh, there, there was heterogeneity, but if you're taking the brain from a 90 year old individual, perhaps that complexity has come and gone. Another possibility, which we find very interesting, haven't done anything to test it, but we know that fibril material can be transported physically from one part of the brain to another. It's a scary thing. And my friend and colleague, Jim Mastriani, who works on prion disease, assures me that that's true of beta amyloid as well, which is really scary. Um, the idea that Alzheimer's disease could be in part a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. I don't want that to be the case, yeah. but it might be the case. Thank you. Yeah, or, are there other questions from participants? Um, I have a couple of you, questions. I have a question. Oh, good. Adam, you can go ahead, I can wait. Okay, Steve, um, it's very interesting that you see the CMC is similar to what uh, Teplo reported, um, I think many years ago. I think 18 micromolar uh, for A beta, but depends on the conditions too, right? The temperature and pH and so on. So I was wondering why wouldn't you see difference for your modified peptide with the octanoil hydrophobic group? Because the hydrophobicity is the main driving force to form the micelle like yeah, yeah, structure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I mean, uh, that's a that's, that's a great question. I, you know, I I I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you, we also, by the way, octanoylated. Um, I didn't show this, but the two lysine side chains, mm -hmm. and uh, we do see a lowering of the CMC with either of those, especially Where with the. the Especially with where the, are the light? I forgot the sequence. Sequence uh, can sixteen you... and twenty-eight, and the oh, okay. sixteen and twenty-eight, and the twenty-eight is the biggest difference. So it's again, we think most of this micellization, it involves the C terminal domain. Correct. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, Bikash, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, very nice talk. I have a lot of questions actually because all of the techniques that you are using, we are also using in our lab. So to start with, uh, I have a question from the high-speed AFM data that you have shown. That is really nice. Which so, uh, 
Which data? The, Sorry. The high speed AFM data. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering, like, did you look at the fusion of oligomers, like, in the presence and absence of zinc? Because you have shown that, like, the A beta oligomers, like, in the absence of zinc, they can fuse. So what yeah. happens when you have zinc? Yeah, yeah. They they make big particles. They make they, they they flocculate at high concentrations and even at low concentrations, they stay in solution, but they make much bigger, much bigger aggregates. And you lose some NMR intensity because I think some of them are still in solution, but they're they become NMR invisible. You get to a high molecular weight, the uh, peaks get very broad and you basically don't see them in NMR. Right, and your theoretical calculations, you have said that like when there is a fusion, you expect like 1.2 times increase in the height. And if I remember correctly, uh, there is a paper from David Teplo group from UCLA where they have used different kind of like oligomers and they have shown that indeed when the oligomers fuse and you have an increase in the length, there is a decrease in height. So uh, I was wondering like from where this calculation came from. Okay. So I'm not sure which work you're referring to, but they did some work on pickup cross-linked A-beta oligomers. Right. And first of all, those are cross-linked. So that changes the game a little bit. These are not cross-linked. All right. Now, um, this is just a very simple theoretical calculation. If you take two balls and stack them on top of one another, the height increases. Um, and the volume increases if you measure both. But if you have a fusion and make a big ball spherical, the radius will increase by two to the one third power. And that's what we find. So we, that's why we think this is fusion. Now, I, I, I'm not really sure I know how to explain what you're asking about the decrease. Um, I would, I, I don't understand why the um, the other thing is, do you know if they were using in solution AFM? Because you worry about drying out yeah. of the particles. Yeah, they have it, also the high speed AFM results. But is it in solution? In solution, yeah. It is in solution. Yeah. Then I don't know the answer to that. Because the fusion, you cannot like observe the fusion without the dynamics, right? So it should be done in the solution. Okay, right. my second question is from your second talk, like the liquid liquid phase separation that you observe from 1 to 16. So one of the way to characterize these LLPS is like doing some sedimentation assay or weight assay. There are so many techniques. So I was just wondering whether they are actually aggregates in the four degree or they are really LLPS. Do you try to spin them out? Because when you have phase separation, let's say water and oil, even if you centrifuge them, they will remain in phase right. separated, right? Right. So well, yeah, I mean, that is absolutely on the docket because if we want to do NMR, we have to purify or at least enrich in the uh, droplets. And um, so far, we haven't done it. We just, we haven't done we, it. These are very new observations. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but that's very much on the docket. Okay, yeah, then my last question to conclude. So uh, in your molecular dynamic simulation, like you are talking about the accessibility of water to the salt bridge area in different fibers, right? So I have two questions from that. The first thing is that we know that molecular dynamic simulation is very sensitive to the number of replications, like how many times you are doing the simulation yes. and the force field that you are using. So in yes. your case, you have used very long term, like 300 to 400 nanosecond, but your root mean square deviation of the backbone looks like converse somehow around like 10 to 20 nanoseconds. Right. So do you, do you have any kind of replicate in different force fields to see the similar kind of observations? Yes. So. This is um, not my area of expertise, and John and Joan can, I'm sure, comment a lot more about this than I can. But um, Esmail, and we've worked with uh, some with Tobin Sosnick and Carl Fried, um, and um, uh, they are very attuned to force field issues. Um, um, the force field, it's, I'm not gonna get this right, but it's some sort of charm 36, I think, but they've tried a number of different ones. And uh, they've worried about that a lot. And the other thing they've worried about is replicates. They do a lot of replicates. Um, and the replicates level off uh, the RMSD and the RMS uh, both 
level off, as you say, about 20 uh, nanoseconds, and then they're pretty flat. Right, and another thing is actually uh, the, even the water models because different water models in the MD simulation has different kind of polarizability. For example, if you take a two-site model like SPCs in simple point charge, or you are taking a six-site water model, they have different kind of effects. So I'm just wondering, like the conclusion that we are drawing from there, like how it is like correlated to your water models and replicate the yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, here I want to claim blissful ignorance. Um, so I, I know that Esmail and Tobin and Carl worry a lot about that as well, but okay. sort of out of my area of expertise. And um, we're about to submit the manuscript and maybe we'll get some comment about that. But, um, but I know that that's something that they care about a lot. Uh, John, do you have any... Yeah. I mean, I would just comment to say that a Charm 36 would be a good choice, I believe, for those particular simulations. And it's probably paired with a TIP 3P water model, which, of, like every other water model, doesn't get everything right, but is reasonable for um, the ion pairing interaction. And so you have that salt bridge, uh, the D23, K28 salt bridge, or, and that, that should be, you know, hopefully would be modeled reasonably well, but you're absolutely right. You, you know, if you're doing one force field, you always have that concern, but I'm, I'm sure as Steven said, I'm sure that they're being, um, being careful with that. I, I had actually a question too about the fibril. Um, you showed the unraveling at the ends. And I agree with you that that, that is an interesting effect and, and uh, it could provide insight into the ends of, uh, of, of fibrils. Uh, but what did you also see this sort of diff change in registration and the disordering of the side chains in the innermost layers? Uh, I couldn't see from the projection. Is that something that you were observing sort of propagating over the full fibril? Yeah, yes, it did. Um, it was much more pronounced at the ends and much more pronounced where things were a little bit more mobile, could move around a little more. But, but yes, we did see a little bit of it. Um, the fact is that <clears throat> the model of that brain-seated fibril, um, it was a model, not a structure, okay? And um, it, it made a very naive, um, assumption here, which is that the three molecules in the layer were coplanar, which they're almost certainly not. Um, so it does, in a sense, the fact that we're developing a register in a sense is um, reassuring because right. some of the other things did not change. Some of the other assumptions we made did not change. Yeah, no, I thought those results were quite interesting. Well, it's, it's 11.45 now, and we've had a, a wonderful talk and a, a great discussion. I'd just like to thank, well, Stephen, but also all of the attendees um, that have participated uh, in this event today. Thanks, thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Thanks, thank John. You. Thanks, Steve. Um, yeah. I still had a couple of questions, maybe. <laughs> in, in your, I'm, uh, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> so why, say, I know you don't see the chemical shit perturbation. Um, let's say you go to the mice, the above CMC, they do have weak interaction yeah, for sure because they form mice cells. Yeah. So do you see, uh, or can you look at the line width or volume of the peaks to see the C terminus is behaving differently than other regions. So we did, you may not see C, but um, yeah. So, yeah, we did, you know, we did a lot of relaxation studies and yeah. uh, different concentrations, T, T1, T2, uh, T1 row, um, geez, what some else? Side is? chains? So, um, um, look, side at, chains. look at some of the side chains too. Um, <clears throat> didn't really, didn't really see any broadening, but we were looking at pretty low concentrations. And I think at the higher concentrations, we probably would see some broadening. And uh, I think, you know, your studies, uh, well, basically using some of the solids methods, I think that would be much more uh, informative. Yep, yep, interesting. Yeah, 
Please. So, uh, Bikar has a question. Yeah, I have a last question. Like regarding your PR NMR experiment, like like because you are you are looking at the R2, which is always also depend on the aggregate size of your particle. So, do you have any control like when you mutate to cysteine and you are comparing with wild type? Do they have any difference in the aggregation propensity, and that is reflected in your R2? Yeah, we uh, we looked at the aggregation at the thioflavin T kinetics, and they're they're identical. Doesn't change it at in all. In terms of their lag time, nothing. Okay. But we worried about that because you know it's kind of a hydrophobic molecule we're putting, and um, we chose to substitute for that reason two hydrophobes. Um, <clears throat> tyrosine isn't all that hydrophobic, but it's fairly hydrophobic. Okay. And leucine. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, I'm I'm not gonna bother you with the, with the question, but just uh, hopefully mine is short. Do you worry about tau tangles in the brain extracts? Oh, gee, yes. I mean, of course. I mean, I know. Um, I, I worry very much about tau. I mean, I think. Do, do, do you, know, you get uh, rid of it somehow in the brain extracts, or it's impossible the way no. you're? Um. I don't know how to get rid of it for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I want to get rid of it for another, uh, but I, I do think and worry about it a fair amount. Um, I think it's there. Um, you know, um, I just think, you know, I think, well, I've got a somewhat small, I have a fairly small group and uh, it's, one of the, it's one of the complications I've uh, decided to, forego um, just because I don't know how to deal with that. I mean, it's a whole other system, but, uh, but I think it's a very important question. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. And please remind your uh, graduate students or anybody just to apply for a Zoominar presentation. I will, I will. Yeah, we, we still have that going on. We should have kind of refreshed on that. So yeah, I mean, do send out notifications because uh, yeah, I definitely, Definitely want to hear more of these. Sure. That message is for everybody, including all the participants and all the registered yeah, uh, yeah, members. So Anybody, every, everybody in yeah, the world. Every, yeah. <laughs> okay, Steve, uh, there is a, um, there's a reference recommended by Max Lindbergh on the purity of the peptides for A-beta published by Sarah Lindsay uh, in 2020. So I posted that in the chat. Um, Okay. Chat box. You should be able to get it. If not, I can send you by email as no. well. So, yeah, that would be great. But I think uh, I think there is something what uh, Max Lindbergh said. Uh, I do I do have similar feeling that the biologically expressed peptides are definitely higher purity. It depends on who is expressing and purifying than synthetic peptide because synthetic peptides comes with fragments and whatnot. Your TFA is obvious and so on. But biological ones um, are can be impure but can be purified um, better based on the mass spec data and um, HPLC as well. Well, I, 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 have some, I have some strong opinions about that too. I just, you know, I, we, we've, we've done both. And for a solid state NMR, sometimes you want the site specific labels and it, yep. it, you can't really get them without synthesis, not very well. Um, yep. But, there are all these claims about um, the, um, there was one paper where they said that there was racemization um, in synthetic peptides that you don't get in the expressed peptides. And so the synthetic peptides aggregate more slowly than the expressed peptides. And we tested that and we didn't see that. We did not see that. So I don't know, I'm not sure why, but do you find that there's a difference? I don't know, I don't know. So I gotta go back, check and take the notes. Yeah, yeah I and, don't know. But I impurities mean, can be there, definitely. It's 100% pure, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. It's like my, my PhD thesis um, advisor, Francois Kesdi, um, he used to say that with proteins, purity is not like virginity. It's not an all or nothing affair, you know? So, so 
And no matter how much you purify a protein, it's still got impurities in it. And we all know that, but you know, it's pure to an extent or by a criterion. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a difficulty with the in vitro studies, right? Right. You purify, 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 it becomes abstract work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. John, we want to ask you a question. Um, John, first of all, thank you. You unmute, please. Yeah. You would unmute. I'm not speaking. Thank you for 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 for. for <laughs> thank you for doing this for us, and then we need advice from you that we are trying to bring in early career uh, researchers to speak in this uh, yeah. series. Yeah. So we do have a lot of speakers to be invited, but we don't have slots. So, okay. do you have any thoughts on how to? <laughs> You yeah. have more speakers than you have slots. Correct. Hmm. Do you want us to? So, do you want us to increase the number of presentations per day or per week? Mm -hmm. That's one idea. Second is moving that to maybe creating another, opening up another day in the working day in addition to the Saturday. Yeah. Uh, do you going beyond <laughs> July is another thing. It looks like we can go beyond oh, July because how was the participation to today? Was this was this typical? It's my first time behind the scenes, so I've never been able to see how many participants and who was here. This is typical. We have we have been seeing seventy five to one hundred seventy or so. Yeah. How many were there today? Today was about seventy five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We that have a total. To, we have a total registration of around eight hundred. Oh okay. Yeah. Wow. I'll yeah. tell you one thing. Um, I sometimes tune into the emerging topics in NMR. And uh, what they do there is they have two talks. Yep. Shorter talks, obviously. Yep. But that's more yeah. focused on NMR, right? Because people already know NMR and then the question starts from there. But this one right. is completely open. Yeah. We have questions from all over, um, from chemistry to physics to biology and so on. Right, right. Yeah, I think Stephen's idea about maybe changing the format and having two shorter talks. I mean, it's great when you can have an hour and 45 minutes like we had today so that you can have a lot of uh, in-depth discussion and, uh, you know, covering more topics. But if you, what about that idea? You could have a, it's, it's a tough, it's tough. There's so much competition. I, I go to so many seminar series and I think adding more during the week is hard, but then people, you know, so. I think we are. Format maybe, unless you want to just do early career symposium and do a day or a few days where you tried to use more time. I think um, the one, I think uh, we all have a little bit of Zoom fatigue, of course, but um, I'll tell you, uh, I, I do think it's important to get the young folk in there somehow uh, because, and you, um, the having a new investigator format has the advantage that it's dedicated to them. It has a disadvantage it probably won't be tuned into quite as frequently. Correct. Right. So I don't know. I mean, I, I really like a, a, I like the longer in-depth talks, but I think that you can have a good, a good event with a short format. Yeah. Um, a lot of, I think be, partly because of the Zoom fatigue, that's being adopted in a, in a lot of symposia that normally would have longer talks. And, uh, and I, think, I think it can work very well. So that, I think that's a nice idea. You know, the thing is people have this in their schedule, maybe just fitting more in the hour and a half that you've been doing. Yeah, yeah. You've had more, you've had, haven't you had at least one event with, with two speakers? It's mentor and mentee combination. So you should bring your mentee. I should? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now you already heard that, okay? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. He sent out emails. <laughs> okay, well, John is caught. Sorry. <laughs> we, have Zoom, we have Zoom fatigue, but we also have email fatigue. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, we have the easy, yeah, early career presentation is going to be at least two per day, two per week. And we will extend beyond July. Two per week, and then you're going to use the Saturday. Two per means in, two per Saturday. One Saturday. Two per Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. A shorter format. Yeah, 
35 to 40 minutes should be long enough. Yeah, it's good. That's great. But this is great. It allows us to ask lots of questions and learn the topic very well. Thank you very much, Steve, for being very patient and uh, thorough in explaining. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. And uh, yeah, I will spread the word for sure. Uh, Rams and Stephen, I have last comment for the Max question that no. we are discussing a lot. No. So Max, I just want to- Max, you want to join us? Yeah, I think I can- Max, you can it. join us. Hi, yeah, Max. So, is he, is he here? Max is gone, I think. He's, he's yes. here. Um, yeah. He's still here. <laughs> He's yeah, here. I think the I think the oh, concern he's here. He's that, in the panel. Yeah, I think the concern he was showing is actually like if you look at the purification protocol from the Knowles group, where they have shown a very nice TST curve for all of his papers. So what then what generally they do instead of using HPLC, Max they actually is, use because Max is in the panel. He can let him talk because he may be from Sarah Lindsay group. Max, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, so go ahead and tell because he may have the experience in purifying it. Could you give us more insights into that? Well, um, I'm quite a new PhD student in Sarah Lins's group. Oh, okay. So I don't yeah. have the details, but, uh, but yeah, that's okay. Checked, but uh, the paper you friends. pointed out is a very important paper. If you know, you can tell us as much as you want to tell us and we will read the paper definitely. Yeah, uh, because I just, um, yeah, I knew it. Yeah, we talk about the importance of purity, and this is the method we use. So, but I haven't really dug into how we assess that purity. So I try to do that a bit now while in the background. And yeah, it's in that paper linked. It's stated as 99.99 percent .99 pure, yeah. and uh, they reference the older paper where they seem to be doing it by. Uh, partly mass spec uh, and also amino acid composition um, analysis. Um, so, yeah, uh, but I don't know. They don't mention the, the number there, and that's a bit older paper. So I don't know where that 99.99% .99 comes from, but I will definitely ask Sara that next time I see her and see if uh, yeah. how we determine that and if I can get... Yeah, more information on that. So mass spec, um, there are issues with both of those techniques, mass spec and the amino acid composition. Amino acid composition is um, not high resolution just because, you know, no matter which technique you use, um, it just is not, it, it just doesn't give you the uh, degree of specificity that you're looking for. As far as mass spec, the problem there is that some, some compounds fly much better than others. And it's very hard to quantify. Um, you have to do a lot of tricks, each of which is problematic to quantify by mass spec. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. How, what would you say would be the best way to assess purity? Oh. I mean, mass spec is the best way, but, but I'm just saying, 99.99, um, I'm a little skeptical of that number. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I, don't, I have no idea how, how they arrived at that particular number, but... Uh, and yeah, you know, the thing is, what you're doing here is you're looking for impurities and you never ever know what you don't see. You only know no, what you exactly. do see. <clears throat> Yeah, I think in terms of size exclusion chromatography, in order to avoid HPLC, the group like from Knowles and others, so they actually use a very uh, like strong like denaturant, like seven molar guanidine hydrochloride in the so presence of ED. But then you're then you're adding denaturant, and you can guanylate your lysines. You know, you can do all sorts of stuff like that. Why do you uh, avoid HPLC? I don't understand what is bad about HPLC. No, no, definitely both are like good. Like the thing is that because they are showing very nice aggregation kinetics because in our lab, sometimes we show, see like secondary nucleations, like it, like the curves are not very linear, right? So based on like whatever they are showing, it looks like the purity of the sample is really good than what we are using in the last time. That is what I think Max was concerned about. Well, yeah, because we, we yeah. collaborate with the Knowles group a lot. So they probably yeah, purify it the same way. 
Uh, but yeah. But you know, there's a lot more to there's a lot more to a beta than aggregation kinetics. And I just yeah, definitely. Oh, I just I know. I mean, I know uh, Thomas Knowles is he's he does the work is absolutely gorgeous. I love it. But but um, I think avoiding HPLC is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, I will definitely discuss this with people in the group, see see what they say. They, uh, yeah, I haven't thought about this this much before. So yeah, it's really good discussion. Really nice to hear your input. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. I mean, I love it when people get a little, you know, when you get a little bit of a pro and con uh, going back and forth. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Thanks, Max, very much. I mean, this is this is an area of concern, right? Because literature is filled with lots and lots of non-producible, non-reproducible data. I mean, cross-seeding is another area. Exactly fifty percent, fifty percent of studies are not reproducible. Yeah, yeah. Very true about the pro and con. That used to be very common at symposia, and you no. don't hear it much anymore. It's well, kind of no. you know we're. Um... And it is valuable. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it should be done nicely. There's no reason to be impolite, right. but you know, I, I do miss that too. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. All right, that was a great um, presentation and a great discussion. So thank you very much. Thanks to everybody. Thank Thanks to all participants. Thank um, you and uh, thank nice you. seeing everybody. Yeah, nice seeing you. Thank you, bye. Bye. Bye, John. Bye. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye, bye. Bye, John. Okay, I'll wait till people go and then I'll sign off. Okay, I guess I guess we're down to the bottom six to the to the six people left. Oh my goodness. Sorry, Patrick five. gave a great talk in the <laughs> Patrick left. Yeah. So this is this is a great uh, a discussion. It is a concern, major concern. Um, we have done lots of mass spec, mass spec, mass spec because we see the improvement in the purity by just looking at the mass spec. Yeah, HPLC is great. So do you think, uh, how do you get rid of, you, you did say that, but maybe I missed it. To completely remove TFA, do you do lots of dialysis or what? Well, we do dialysis and lyophilization repeatedly. Yeah, repeatedly. And we monitor, and we monitor using fluorine NMR. Um, we've, I mean, we've done that. We have a probe that picks up fluorine. Um, you know, it's uh, good to an extent, I guess. And it's so once you do, uh, once you follow the procedure, and then you do repeat it several many times for the next batch, or do you do check with fluorine every time? No, we don't check every time because it's especially you know we need to. It's not a probe we have in the magnet all the time. Yeah. So, um, well, we did that series of experiments. I mean, if we if we dialyze. Um, and lyophilize three times how much fluorine is left. If we do it five times, how much fluorine is left? And uh, three seems to be the magic number here. Okay, okay. Depends on the amount of the sample, maybe. All right, great. Thank you okay. very much, Steve. All right, thank you, Rams. Nice, nice, nice seeing you, Bikash. Bye. Bye.